Founded in 2014, SoundGuys is a consumer electronics review website that deals exclusively with audio products. Our primary focus is on personal audio, which means we cover all kinds of headphones, headsets, accessories, and related peripherals. We also cover portable Bluetooth and smart speakers, networked audio devices and streaming services, microphones, and other semi-professional audio products. In addition to reviews, we post educational features on topics such as how to read graphs and what is total harmonic distortion, and deep dives into subjects like hearing health, audio media formats, battery life, and the sustainability aspects of consumer audio. Our mission at SoundGuys is clear, to help customers make the right buying decision. We do this using our extensive knowledge of consumer technology. Our team is comprised of seasoned technology journalists, product reviewers, test engineers, and video producers. Crucially, our site is intended to be accessible to the layperson, providing information that doesn't require any prior scientific knowledge to understand. To this end, we've been finding some success, recently surpassing 1.4 million unique monthly visitors, generating 2.6 million page views a month. I'm AJ Wikes. I joined the SoundGuys team at the end of 2020. I'm responsible for designing the tests we carry out on each product we review. I also do the majority of the product testing myself. To date, I've run measurements on over 300 headphones. Here's a bit about my background. In the late 90s, I started my journey in the world of acoustic measurement, cutting my teeth running measurements the old-fashioned way with the Bruel and Kea 2610 measuring amplifier, the 4185 ear simulator, and the Type 2012 analyzer at one of the world's leading cell phone producers at the time. As well as the acoustic integration of speakers and microphones, I've performed various roles at various companies, including DSP parameter tuning, configuring production line testers, auditing transducer supplier quality, diagnosing field failures, and designing listening tests. I also spent time at a hearing aid producer characterizing medical grade hearing instruments. All told, I spent thousands of hours working with B&K's 4128 head and torso simulator and similar test mannequins produced by its competitors. These experiences allowed me to see how electronic devices are designed and mass produced from the inside, whilst learning from some of the best engineers and scientists in the business. I also made a lot of acoustic measurements on lots and lots of prototypes. This all feeds into what I do at SoundGuys, whether it's designing acoustic tests, making measurements, interpreting data, or providing specialist knowledge to our writers and reviewers. While there are numerous review sites that focus only on the high end, or what the headphone hobbyist community is interested in, which are largely the wired, over-ear, and in-ear monitor categories, SoundGuys covers the gamut of what's out there in the world of headphones. We test and review all kinds of headphones, over-ears, on-ears, and in-ears. This includes everything from the most inexpensive wired earbuds to the latest full-featured true wireless hearable type products via all kinds of Bluetooth niche products for runners, gym goers, and commuters through to over-ear headphones for critical listening. And of course, the expansive and increasingly innovative world of headsets designed for gamers which connect using multiple protocols, including USB or proprietary RF dongles and base stations. We quantify all of these using our standard test strategy, so the data can be directly compared across all of these product categories. Everything is kept consistent so that by using output multiplexing and signal switching from the analysis PC, we can test any of the products that come through our door in the same way. We needed a reliable method to match the loudness of each headphone's output for a few reasons. A-B listening tests must be fair and measurements should also be made at a comparable loudness level. Simply level matching at a single frequency does not achieve this, since headphones that include active electronics or DSP can include all manner of signal processing, such as loudness control, equalization, compressors and limiting, it's necessary to first use a test signal with similar characteristics to typical music but is steady state in nature. Our chosen method uses a simulated program source stimulus measured using standalone loudness level meters that measure according to EBU R128. Using this technique, we can be sure that each headphone is driven at a level that would sound equivalent to a person listening according to the standard. We measure headphone frequency responses using IEC 602687 as a guide. The left and right channels are tested in sequence so we can assess inter-channel crosstalk. 
We also log data on interchannel variation, distortion and latency. Visitors to our site can be of any age, background or educational level. And while we collect a lot of data on the products we test, we don't want to overwhelm the reader with technical readouts. To address this challenge, we distill our findings down to as few charts as possible for presentation in our reviews, including typically one single frequency response chart to illustrate the playback behavior of the product. All our published frequency responses are uncompensated, with left and right measurements presented as a single average curve with smoothing applied. This makes the charts easy to read on any device and allows us to present comparison charts, allowing readers to easily compare products. As we know, headphones should be properly measured using either quality microphones inside actual human ears or using accurate electroacoustic ear simulators specifically as part of an artificial head, such as the b and 5128. Testing on a realistic head is an important part of creating realistic usage conditions, particularly for any of the headband mounted headphones, where the band must be stretched to a suitable head size to produce the correct pressure on the ear pad or on the ear itself. Since a headphone's response measured at or close to the eardrum should include the approximate features of the head-related transfer function to sound natural or correct, this makes interpreting the measured data when published in a magazine or a website a bit more complex than it is with a free field measurement of a loudspeaker, for example. We decided that it was necessary to display an ideal frequency response for headphones measured at the eardrum to help our readers interpret the response charts and also to provide a target for the sound quality scoring system we use on the site. We considered the established targets, free field, on axis, which assumes an anechoic environment, diffuse field, which assumes a totally reflective room. When headsets were developed early on for communications, these targets seemed appropriate. However, since the vast majority of music and other content is intended to be consumed over loudspeakers, headphones need to replicate that experience and listener testing has indicated that the free field and diffuse field responses shown are not right for this purpose. Psychoacoustic investigations provide evidence that listeners prefer alternate headphone targets to diffuse field and free field target standards. A real listening room is somewhere in between the diffuse field and free field extremes, known as a semi-reflective field, or SRF. The Harman target is a consumer preference research curve based on the idea of what good speakers in a good room sound like, i.e. the semi-reflective field, SRF, found in a typical listening room. I won't be detailing the development of the Harman target here. Dr. Olive has covered this extensively elsewhere. The team at Harman clearly recognizes the importance of using a more realistic test setup and have developed a version of their target curve for the artificial head that seems to be becoming the standard but unfortunately they did not share their 5128 target. Rather than attempt to modify the preference curve produced by Dr. Olive's team at Harman, we sought to develop our own target curve. We selected a group of benchmark products and used the measured data to produce a single response chart. Here's what that exercise produced. So far we've found this target works quite well and we've stood by it. Once we established our headphone target curve, it became clear from the data we collected that a number of the headphones we tested were a long way off our target, particularly at the low end, where the acoustic output was lacking compared to our curve. Notably, this applied to many models of headphones marketed towards producers of music, many of which were already held in high regard as industry standard tools in the world of content creation. Rather than simply ignoring this fact, we developed a second target curve that was a better match for this segment and dubbed it the Sound Guys Studio Curve. This decision received some criticism, particularly because by acknowledging or encouraging the segmentation of the headphone market into creators and consumers with different characteristics for each, the so-called circle of confusion would persist. And while the criticism is valid, it didn't help explain why there are apparently divergent targets on what a headphone should sound like, apparently even within the headphone producing companies themselves. Is this just a ruse by the headphone industry to sell us more sets of headphones, or is there more to it than that? Let's attempt to unravel this mess. Firstly, we need to recognize that applying either the standard diffuse field or free field correction curves we saw earlier makes the assumption that the loudspeaker sound source produces a flat frequency response when measured in the listening environment. But we know that while a loudspeaker having a flat anechoic response on axis is considered ideal, 
Once you place it in the real world listening room, a flat measured response is not the goal. Floyd E. Tool's listener preference work established what the response of a loudspeaker should look like in a listening room. It could be argued that since such extensive work has already been done on listener preferences, when it comes to listening to loudspeakers in a room, it should not be necessary to repeat this exercise with headphones. After all, the same preference findings should apply to the spectral balance of the program material at the listener's ears. It should simply be a matter of applying the correct transfer function from loudspeakers to headphone. So if we apply the free field and diffuse field curves that assume a flat source to the speaker in room preference function, we get two new targets. The speaker in room preference modified diffuse and free field responses. These targets represent the two extremes of reflective versus acoustically treated, highly absorptive environments. As you can see, the resulting curves have a lot in common with the first sound guy's target curve we derived previously. Investigating the b and 5128's free field response in a room. To better understand what a headphone target curve should look like, I decided to investigate how the free field correction supplied by b and compared with my own measurements of our 5128 measured in our highly damped but non-anechoic test booth. A test fixture was fabricated to allow consistent placement of our omnidirectional measurement microphone in the same effective location as the drum reference point of our 5128 when the fixture was substituted for the head in the same location. Our torsoless head simulator also gained some shoulder simulators, seen here adorned with a rather fetching black duct tape Sound Guys branded jacket. One Test Lab Studio monitor speaker was placed, together with its matched subwoofer, on axis with the 5128 and measurements made comparing what was captured at the ear with the free field mic measurement. Results are shown with smoothing applied. The data shows a good match with B&K's data for the zero degree on axis measurement at one meter, with some notable deviations below 1600 Hz, since our test room is clearly far from anechoic below this threshold. Compared to the anechoic measurement, the ear in the room measurement receives less energy between 200 and 600 Hz, and there's a few dBs of lift occurring below 100 Hz. This tells us something about how real-world rooms differ from anechoic rooms in the lower frequencies. Although since our room is not typical and has dimensions nowhere near a standard listening room, we're not going to base any further assumptions on these in-room characteristics below 1600 Hz until we have repeated this characterization process in some other listening rooms and mastering suites. The intent is to repeat this process with multiple speaker systems and rooms to further study how real-world listening environments affect this behavior. So the measurement data aligned with the data supplied with our 5128 head and the characteristic shape looks like the free field response that has been suggested and supposedly rejected for headphones. But this would only apply to headphones if they were attempting to simulate the experience of listening to a single sound source playing a mono signal, as simulated by our test. Stereo speakers are separated and ideally positioned to form an equilateral triangle with the listener. So the measurement was repeated with the speaker at the same one meter distance, but 30 degrees off axis, representing the standard recommended configuration for stereo listening. Signals from the two ears were captured and corrected each using the respective free field mic measurement position. This curve combines the left and right ear measurements. In summary, this shows the combined signals from both ears when the head is placed in the correct orientation based on an equilateral triangle to a high fidelity speaker in our acoustically damped test environment. In an ideal listening room, the room is symmetrical, so the combined signals from the two ears will be equivalent when just the left speaker or just the right speaker is playing. This result was used to modify b &K's free field data for the 30 degree off axis listening position. Then the preferred speaker in room function can be applied, providing a headphone target curve that should work well for stereo material. Having acquired a large database of measurements, we can mine this data and look for trends and make observations, some of which I will share with you here. We're certainly not the first to comment on this, but there is a huge amount of variation in the frequency response shapes we see, not just across different brands, but between product categories from the same brand. Different headphone styles by the same manufacturer look like they're intended to meet different frequency response criteria. Open back and close back over the ear headphones by the same manufacturer can look quite similar, or they can look quite different. 
In light of the data collected, it does seem that there is no universal target that headphone manufacturers are trying to meet, and there is clearly no consensus about what headphones should sound like. Not everyone is designing to the same target. There are notable, highly regarded headphones being sold that are clearly targeting different responses. If we combine the concepts discussed today and refer to the measurement database, it seems as though rather than a single target, we can identify at least 12 different targets that are approximated by headphone responses we have tested in-house. In each of the following cases, speakers refers to the loudspeaker or speakers that the headphones are attempting to replicate. 1. Diffuse field, speakers measure flat in the room. Two, free field off axis, speakers measure flat in the room. Three, more realistic combination of one and two, the semi-reflective field, speakers measure flat in the room. Four, semi-reflective field, Speakers produce an alternative to the flat or preferred in-room response. Five, diffuse field, where the loudspeaker produces the in-room preference curve. Six, free field on axis, where the loudspeaker produces the in-room preference curve. Seven, free field off axis where the loudspeakers produce the in-room preference curve. Eight, a more realistic combination of curves five, six, and seven, a semi-reflective field where the speakers produce the in-room preference curve. Nine, Variation on curve eight with boosted bass or loudness enhancement inspired by equal loudness curves or similar, meaning extra bass and treble. 10, variation on curve eight plus gamer specific features such as a bump at 100 Hertz and or a notch at five kilohertz. 11, Variation on curve eight that ignores the three kilohertz ear gain hump. This seems applied to some in-ear headphones for some reason. 12, others, further characterization needed or not. Targets one to eight are mostly accurate, but which one is correct depends on two things. Thing one, how do you think loudspeakers should sound in a room? Most consider it settled that the combined effect of loudspeakers and the room should present a tilted frequency response that favors low frequencies. But if that is accepted, it means that headphones designed to meet targets one through four are not providing a realistic presentation of stereo speakers in a good room, since they do not take the preferred sloping, low-end biased in-room frequency response into account. Thing two, the stereo image since stereo and mono components will be presented in the same way, with the same frequency response applied to both. The designer's choice of target curve will therefore determine whether it's the integrity of the center image that's compromised, or if it's the width of the stereo image that's compromised. A note on high frequencies. The primary targets we've looked at here show significant variation above 10 kilohertz. We know that listening tests have shown that individual listeners vary considerably in their preference of how much output there is in this frequency range. This variable will therefore also influence which target sounds most correct to most people. Based on our observations, it seems that headphone makers have largely adopted target curves based around the frequency responses that are known to work well for stereo material. However, some seem steadfast in using outdated or legacy curves, perhaps to cater to those who like those legacy curves, or who have had the expectations conditioned by using older products developed using outdated philosophies. 
We also see that brands have developed variants on what works for stereo, with frequency responses for specific use cases or media consumption, although the logic behind them isn't always clear. Thanks for joining us for this presentation today. I hope this has proved interesting. Enjoy the rest of the program. I'm AJ Wikes with Sound Guys. Happy listening.